Okay, brilliant. I think that's everyone. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our webinar, Elevate Your Clinical Practice. My name's Rebecca Dunstall. I'm clinical specialist at CareFlex, physiotherapist by background. Got my colleague, Kim, um, joining us this morning. She's gonna be monitoring the chat function. So for any point, if there's any queries, any clinical questions, any technical issues, then please utilize the chat function and Kim will get back to you. Um, just as mentioned as well that we are recording the sessions. So your videos and mics um, have been turned off so that you're not recorded as part of that. Um, it is theory based today. I haven't got my um my trusty companion Les joining us this morning. Um, it's, this is very much theory based, all around um continuous professional development, how to maximize seating assessments um and interventions. The presentation I'm going to be running through, we will be sharing it after the webinar. Um, and if any questions arise, um, then please again use the chat function um, if you need any access to some of the resources that I mentioned, or if you've got any more questions or anything you want us to support you with, then again use the chat function and we can send everything out after the session. Um, so let's get started. I'm just going to load up the presentation. Let's get that full screen. And that should be there now. Okay, brilliant. So yeah, again, welcome. Um, we are going to be looking at elevating your clinical practice within the world of specialist seating. Now, as postural care professionals, it's essential that we continuously refine our practice so that we can provide the best possible support and interventions for the individuals that we work with, who many will have complex seating needs. I'm going to start by reviewing just quickly the importance of specialist seating to really set the scene for the session. And then we're going to introduce some key hints and tips for you to consider to hopefully help you enhance your clinical practice within this often complex world of specialist seating. Now, as a very basic introduction to body structure and posture, our body structure is multi-segmental, it's highly flexible, which is amazing. So it means we can adopt lots of different postures throughout uh, the day, um, depending on the task at hand and so on. But this does make it inherently unstable and sadly vulnerable to damage. Now, to reduce this very complex system into manageable proportions, we need to consider the body structure as a system of segments, and it just helps us um, to manage our seat and assessment, but also the prescription as well, because we still need to target all these body segments, even in sitting. Uh, the pelvis, of course, the foundation, it dictates what happens above and below, um, and in sitting as well. We've even got to consider the feet, even though it's considered um, um, a transition body segment to get you from A to B, we still take 19% of our body weight through our feet in sitting. So we still got to consider that because it, we need that proprioceptive feedback to get that postural stability. Now, posture in the simplest of terms is essentially the position of one of those or more of those body segments in relation to one another. But also, but also the orientation. Now, postural control is achieved through learning. Uh, we respond to information that is sent to various sources, visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive input, for example, and damage to any of our body systems, whether that's through age, injury, illness, or disease, can affect our ability to interact with that information. Then individuals, like the individuals that we work with will therefore find it increasingly difficult to achieve protective postures, which is then when we start to see postural presentations, postural challenges present themselves. When we talk about postural challenges, um, there is kind of a set path um, to the reasons the reason why body structure distorts. We, of course, initially have the individual's inability to change position independently, whether that's through physical concerns, cognitive impairments, yeah. communication issues, sensory issues. But this tends to then lead to asymmetrical positioning. We then have gravitational forces um, that can trap individuals in destructive postures, and then that results in the exaggeration of those asymmetries. 
So we'll see um, unequal loading on those body segments and sadly the, the um, presentation of some significant postural challenges, things like pelvic instability, posterior pelvic tilt, um, increased thoracic kyphosis, scoliosis, and so on. We have got specific booklets of these are new terms too, if you're new to postural care. Um, we do have um, some booklets that breaks down the body segment and some of the postural challenges that can be associated with it um, and some solutions that, that can help. Um, so again, if that's something that you um, you think would be helpful, then pop it in the chat and I'm sure Kim can direct you to that. Now, postural care is the holistic use of any technique that we can implement as therapists to minimize postural abnormality whilst enhancing functional movement. And it's an approach that aims to preserve, and in some cases, hopefully even restore body shape for individuals with movement difficulties. Now, the good news is, and contrary to popular belief, body distortion is not inevitable. So with the right equipment at the right time um, and support with positioning techniques, we can help to protect the body shape and the body structure and all those body segments that we mentioned. But why is postural care important? Probably a good question to ask yourself to remind yourself of why we might be doing what we're doing. Of course, we've got our clinical objectives, but if we bring it back to the individual, if we see Callum here, and the impact this is going to have on daily life and think, why is postural care important to him? Well, this is why I just love this image. I think it's a perfect visual representation of what it actually means for the individuals we work with when we get it right. Now, specialist seating is probably helpful here to define specialist seating and its role within 24-hour postural care. Again, this can open up a whole new tangent for me, but when we talk about postural care, it does need to have a 24-hour approach. Um, and how do we integrate specialist seating within that to adopt different postures throughout the day, depending on the task? Um, but specialist seating itself is a critical element that essentially aims to allow individuals who might otherwise have difficulty sitting in standard seating to achieve their optimum sitting posture. And I say optimum here because we, we're we not always going to get that gold standard 90-90-90 sitting position, especially with complex presentations. We still need to strive for their optimum positioning. If we can't correct their posture, then we still need to accommodate to reduce the risk of further deterioration. I thought it'd be helpful be here helpful. as well before we go on to um, elevating to hint and tips for elevating in clinical practice to really recap around the key principles of seating, um, just to help understand how special seating plays that role within that 24 hour postural care approach. Now, comfort is a top priority for us at CareFlex because being comfortable and feeling safe is key to increasing tolerance and maximizing compliance with a piece of equipment. If the individual is uncomfortable, then they simply won't use that piece of equipment and we definitely won't then achieve our clinical objectives. Postural stability, especially at the pelvis, is at the foundation for optimal sitting position, is critical for things like comfort and energy management and encouraging normal movement. If you're working with individuals with abnormal muscle tone, for example, or um, involuntary movement, somebody with hunting disease who presents with chorea movements, that pelvic and postural stability can really help dampen down some of those abnormal movements and facilitate more normal movement patterns. Uh, when we think about function, I'm sure you know that we must promote function and independence because it's an important factor in living a fulfilling life. But from a physical perspective, movement is also important to protect the body structure. And this links back to postural support because we can only achieve functional movement with proximal stability because it's a requirement for that distal control. Posture and pressure are inextricably linked to <clears throat> the way we position our body segments um, has a direct impact on the pressure going through specific body sites. So it's that simple. Um, we are seeing a shift, thankfully, in the understanding around how posture impacts on pressure. And it's not just plonking cushions on top of cushions anymore. Um, it is more about that whole seating system um, and addressing the, the postural and pressure care needs as one so that we can essentially the goal, get as much of the person in contact with the chair as possible. So we've got maximum pressure distribution over the maximum surface area. 
um, but also utilising equipment to achieve different positions. So when we talk about pressure care, research has shown that the best method to prevent skin damage is repositioning this regular change of position throughout that full 24 hours. So we can use the functions of the chair to achieve that within that 24 hour approach. Things like tilt and space and back angle recline and leg rest elevation, as long as it is safe and appropriate for the individual. Another major goal in postural care um, and a way the special seating can help is to enhance autonomic nervous system function. So if an individual is unable to sit upright, so they're unable to fight those effects of gravity and hold themselves rigid, um, then it can result in a decline in their overall health. And this is primarily reflected in altered physiological function. So things like their breathing ability, safe eating and drinking, digestion and so on. But safety is also about the fundamental goal of keeping them secure in the seating as well. So when going back to individuals who may be involuntary movements, um, who uh, maybe need support with safe transfers into and out of equipment, we can use the seating to enable that as well. And then lastly, well-being. This is all about interaction and engagement being able to participate in hobbies and occupation, being able to interact with the environment and socialize with loved ones. If somebody has a stable posture, it can offer them a better line of vision for communication. It can provide increased ability to achieve cognitive tasks and hopefully improve their overall quality of life. So really that's just highlighting how specialist seating can really target those key principles. And it is obviously a very quick overview. If you want any more information on bits of that, then again, please use the chat function. Um, we've done lots of webinars that covers things like this in a bit more detail if you wanted links to some recordings and so on. So what we're gonna focus on today then, um, on hints and tips on how to elevate your clinical practice within the world of specialist seating. So we're gonna look at prioritizing the individual, mastering the art of the seat and assessment, the ability to develop MDT workings so or multidisciplinary approach, being mindful of support network needs, um, being able to educate and empower others, maintaining continuous evaluation as part of that seat and provision, engaging in our own professional development and how important our role is within advocating and promoting awareness as well. Now, personalised care is essentially based on what matters to the individual and is key to achieving the best possible outcomes. If we understand their needs um, and if we build rapport and trust with them and their caregivers where necessary, um, it can be essential in providing effective specialist seating solutions. We need to ensure that their preferences are at the centre of seating decisions so that we can create tailored and supportive interventions to then achieve our own clinical objectives. We need to take the time to listen to concerns, empathise with challenges where possible, um, and really put ourselves in their shoes. <clears throat> if we can establish open communication and respect their autonomy throughout that process, um, again, we can see better incomes, better compliance with our care plans. Um, this might be needed to provide them with um, easy read information. We might need to change our communication style um, to ensure that they have the information they need to make informed decisions where appropriate about the management and then involve them in that decision making process as equal partners. So we might have to, depending on the audience, alter the way that we communicate and the methods and the format that we use as well. And research has shown that if we build this trust and rapport, if we work with them as equal partners, then we will see improvements in compliance and outcomes, which is essentially why we do what we do to achieve those clinical objectives whilst considering the individual and prioritizing them at the center. If we empower individuals to be actively engaged, we do see better outcomes. And um, this is a great um, quote from Hippocrates. Um, it, is more, it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. And of course, we can use individuals' um, diagnoses to help guide um, if we know a certain trajectory or a decline that some conditions have, or maybe in rehab settings, we might know what their rehab potential is. Um, but ultimately, even if somebody, um, we have two individuals, for example, who have been diagnosed with a stroke, they're going to be two very different individuals, but two very different presentations. So that's um, no one, their diagnosis can just help guide. But really, we, we just deal with the individual that's presented in front of us.
Now, a thorough and systematic assessment is the cornerstone of successful specialist seating interventions because it allows us to identify the optimum seating solution. Um, by enhancing your seating assessment skills, um, we need to understand the interplay between the individual's body, the seating system, but also the environment as well. Um, if we follow a comprehensive process that considers these wide-ranging aspects of daily life, so things like their health and social factors, their physical and psychosocial needs, their cognitive abilities and how they communicate, um, especially understanding how they communicate pain. Um, I've worked with individuals who giggle or chuckle when they're in pain, um, and I might think that actually that's them saying they're comfortable, but actually saying they're uncomfortable. So understanding that um, is really key before we get hands on and do our postural assessment. But we need that comprehensive process, um, that systematic approach to it to make sure that we get all the information that we need. Now, that information gathering can be split into two equally important parts. Um, so this is really key. It's not just about the physical assessment. Um, we need to do the history taking as well. That's really important to gather information about their medical history, their social history, um, then conducting this thorough, thorough physical examination, um, observing them in their baseline supporting surface can be really helpful as well, but then also reviewing them in the, the recommended seating system that we are um, that we are providing too. But just remember that a full postural assessment may be a necessary precursor to the seating assessment. So they're two different things depending on the individual. Now, this is if this isn't something that you feel you are confident or competent in, then maybe some further formal learning may be indicated for that. And there are some fantastic um, courses and higher education courses and further education courses out there that can expand your skills and knowledge within postural care assessments. Now, if we provide a holistic, personalised care approach, um, this often involves collaborating with various health and social care professionals. When we talk about seating, um, that includes occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, and even nurses, district nurses, tissue viability nurses, and so on. Now, we need to establish those strong working relationships to create inter interdisciplinary management plans that address the individual's needs as comprehensively as possible. And a key part of this is communication, whether that's through uh, meetings, sharing case studies, um, engaging in further training together, um, but that's a really strong basis then for working together with the individual. That collaborative approach can ultimately help ensure that all aspects of the person's daily life are considered from different standpoints, because we've all got different um, strengths and weaknesses and um, different skills, sets and knowledge bases from our training and from our experiences that will hopefully then lead to better outcomes and a true holistic um, approach to specialist seating. An MDT approach involves drawing appropriately from all those multiple disciplines to explore problems and reach solutions that are based on a new understanding of sometimes complex situations. Um, kind of like having a fresh pair of eyes on situations. You can see different standpoints um, and understand an overall picture. Um, I remember when I was a newly qualified physiotherapist and very much still in the mind frame of um, understanding someone's physical abilities and limitations and really sadly focusing on that, not really understanding the complexities of MDT working yet and going in to see an individual uh, doing a seating assessment, um, understanding that, yeah, um, they needed pelvic support, needed to stabilize the pelvis, we needed um, to sec secure them, give them some, some proprioceptive feedback through the feet to try and dampen down some abnormal movements, um, get them comfortable, consider some of those um, toe muscle tonal issues and get the special seating in place. Um, and then going back to review a few weeks later and the individual they hated the chair, um, didn't want to use the chair. Um, I couldn't understand why. Asked an OT colleague to a senior OT colleague to come in and review the situation with me. Um, and simply asking what you need this chair to do, what, what are your hobbies that you enjoy doing? And and the individual simply wanted to spend time in the kitchen with her mother um, cooking. Um, the chair didn't fit under the table. I didn't supply a tray. So suddenly I took that that. Um, 
that core part of her daily life away from her and and, and stop that enablement. So um, multidisciplinary work and understanding and how all those things come together to make sure that we get a seating solution that not only they're compliant with, but that meets the clinical objectives as well. So we can involve other professionals, we can utilize knowledge and skills and best practice from multiple disciplines, but even across service providers as well, um, across those boundaries. So health and social care could be the voluntary sector, private sector providers, and really redefine and reframe provision based on that improved collective understanding of complex needs. Some of the benefits of this will be reducing the complexity and the intensity of the interventions, especially if we've got support from um, different individuals. Hopefully reduce an error rate, a um, prime example there of uh, me as a newly qualified. Increasing staff well-being because we start to see positive outcomes, enhancing patient satisfaction as well, hopefully reducing re-referrals back into us, reducing waiting times, and then seeing improved service provision across the board as well. And this will hopefully then reflect in reduced associated costs too. Some of the um, benefits that we can see, just to go into a bit more detail, really, if we break it down um, on the individual level, improved outcomes, as we know, avoidance of related harm, especially avoidable harm, and we think of things like pressure injuries, where 98% are avoidable, lower mortality rates, um, higher quality, holistic, personalised care. When we think about the professional level, so us as therapists and the, our colleagues that we work with, improved job satisfaction and morale, um, so I hope you people retention as well, staying in jobs, feeling that great autonomy, but also skill enhancement as well and knowledge sharing between colleagues. This then feeds into the organisation level, improves staff retention, making sure the resources are used more efficiently. Um, so again, that frees up resources for other individuals with that significant economic value as well, bringing it back to getting it right the first time so we're not wasting money on equipment that's not needed. Um, and then onto the service and systems level as well, making sure we have this proactive instead of a reactive approach to support um, early identification, because those long term benefits will certainly outweigh the impact of the short term indicators. Now, we've obviously spoken about the individual and um, putting them at the centre of um, our care, but we do need to be mindful of support networks needs as well. Um, considering the needs of the caregivers is going to be um, crucial for successful implementation, especially in complex needs where we may be relying on them to utilise and follow care plans. So we need to involve them in, in the decision making process because their first hand knowledge of the individual's daily routines and they need can provide valuable insights um, where, where necessary. It's also about being sensitive to the emotional and physical demands that caring for a person with complex seating needs can place on caregivers as well. And it's not just about the practical element. So offering them seating that enables um, safe transfers, that reduces um, the load on carers and so on, but also the emotional support as well and the, the guidance to help them manage their own well-being and maintain that positive caregiving relationship. Um, I'm quite fortunate that my, my um, younger sister who is a big part of my life, um, so I'm able to empathise um, my personal motivation really and why I got involved in, in partial care and, and physiotherapy stems from that so being able to draw on some of those life experiences to empathize and understand she has profound and multiple learning disabilities so being able to see it from both sides um, can sometimes help if that's not something that you have life experience of um, then sometimes reading case studies of individuals um, testimonials as well can really help solidify why we need to rely on our support network um, they are at the front line really of providing support and they know firsthand what has worked in the past and more importantly what hasn't worked in the past and having that vital relationship with the person they're caring for. Um, and again, it's just being mindful of things um, just as a, I mean, this is the very small minority, but just being mindful of cases where maybe consent and capacity is an issue or maybe um, safeguarding issues. But I'm, I'm going on a tangent here, but just be my, and mindful of the support network and the positives and the negatives that can that can play into that. Um, I'm sure some of you have been in, in situations where you're finding it difficult to engage support staff as well, and not just loved ones, not just um, 
um, personal carers, but also the professional carers as well, care home settings, multi-user environments. Um, and again, if that's something you need support with and engaging, um, maybe it may be sort of a lack of awareness, a, lack, a training need. If that's something you need support with, then again, reach out to us and see if that's something that we can help with. Now, this leads nicely on to education, which is crucial for both the individual using the specialist seating, but also the caregivers who we might be relying on to follow the care plans safely. Um, we need to determine the confidence levels, but the competencies as well as part of that seating provision so that the care plan reflects it appropriately. Um, if we provide clear easy to understand instructions on how to operate and adjust the chair um, on a daily basis if that's needed, emphasizing particularly the safe use of features and benefits. Um, there are gonna be some times where tilt and space example isn't um, safe. It could be contraindicated for some individuals. Leg rest elevation, if somebody has contractures at the knee, then we need to make it clear that we not to be elevating um, the leg rest in the care plan. So it's not just about the safe use, but when not to use particular functions as well, because we could then, it could just negate all the hard work we put into their postural stability. Where appropriate, then we offer hands-on training and resources for ongoing support. And remember, we can support you with this um, if you are prescribing care flex seating into certain environments and you feel that maybe there's a gap in knowledge, then again, reach out to us. And ultimately, we need to ensure that individuals and the caregivers feel confident, but empowered is a great word to use the seating system um, because that's what will contribute to improved outcomes and satisfaction. It's also about highlighting as well um, how they can get help if there are issues. So if they get to a point where they don't feel like the chair is working anymore um, or they're not getting on with a piece of equipment or they are concerned about certain risks, um, new red areas of skin, for example, or individuals complaining that it's suddenly become uncomfortable, there's a change in need in their condition. And then again, making it very clear, how do they seek that support? How do they reach out? Now, the final part of effective seating provision is the appreciation of the importance of continuous evaluation. Specialist seating intervention should be dynamic and responsive to the changing needs of the individual and their situation. So we need to make sure, as I've already said, that there are processes in place that regularly evaluate the effectiveness of the solution that we've put in place and enable adjustments as needed, such as regular follow-up visits or review clinics. Um, we can use those situations to assess whether it's still effective, monitor any changes in the condition or presentation, and then make the necessary adjustments. And it's also an opportunity as well to address any concerns or questions that the individual or the support network might have to make sure that we continue with that compliance because we won't get our clinical objectives if we haven't got that compliance. If this isn't something that's plausible um, with how you work, so if you work on a one point of contact basis, um, then as I've already touched upon, just you know, make sure that the care plan provides information on risk factors um, that they need to be mindful of and guidance on what to do should those issues arise. What I found is, is particularly helpful, especially maybe in multi-user environments, is finding a key contact um, and having individuals sign that they are happy with care plans because um, they tend to be more on board with things than if they know that they've um, um, formally declared that they are on board and they understand how that care plan works. This ongoing process of evaluation um, and adjustment will help to ensure optimal outcomes over time, especially when we're working with individuals um, with diagnoses that we know sadly regress, or even in rehabilitation settings where we might actually see improvements. So the equipment needs to reflect that and change. So let's move on then to your development specifically. Now, continuous professional development, I'm sure we all know of it as CPD, is a process by which we uh, practice, that we are able to continue to practice safely and effectively by developing our own knowledge and skills. It helps ensure quality, accountability and effective practice. Um, we need to enhance our professionalism and competence and to do that, we need to show and demonstrate that we are actively engaged in the CPD, that we're documenting and evidencing our CPD, but also then applying that learning to our practice. So any activity that we can learn from or develop professionally can be considered appropriate for CPD um, and just ensure that that activity complements our practice and enhances the service that we provide. 
It could be fit, um, split into four different categories. This is just a really helpful um, to break it down to make sure that you're targeting these four areas. And they might highlight some things that you didn't actually realize were part of CBT. Um, and you might want to just document those so you can apply that learning to your practice. So we've got work-based learning, um, reflecting on our experience at work, um, debriefing with colleagues, considering feedback from clients or being a member of a committee maybe. We've got the professional activity, such as being involved in a professional body, facilitating training ourselves, giving presentations at conferences, and really um, using our role to pass on that information as well. Um, we've got formal education, things like attending courses or completing research. But then a really important one is actually self-directed learning as well. So reading and critically appraising articles, uh, books, updating our own knowledge through interactive websites, for example, um, and sharing among our peers. Now, they are all ways for us to maintain our expertise and stay updated on current best practices and new advancements within our specialties, then implementing this evidence-based practice. Again, I'm sure this is a term you all know, um, and is essentially um, what requires us to base our decisions and our interventions on the best available, current, valid and relevant evidence. So those decisions should be made by those receiving care, informed by the knowledge of those providing care um, within the context of the available resources. And by resources, we mean the guidelines that are available, nice guidelines, um, it could be tools, white papers, government support, um, anything that really um, is out there, research papers to help us to um, inform our practice from a safe um, and effective point of view. It also allows us to network with the like-minded professionals like we are today. Um, we can use the chat function to share knowledge and learn from each other um, and contribute to the growth of specialist seating community in general. Now, as already mentioned, CPD requires us to demonstrate that we are keeping up to date with new knowledge, techniques and developments that are linked to our practice. And the key part of this is reflection. So this requires us to stop and think about our practice, consciously analyse our decision making and then relate that back to our clinical work. Reflection helps us to gain insight into our professional practice by thinking analytically about any element of it. We then identify and appreciate positive experience and ways that we can maybe improve next time on service delivery. But it also can be useful when we've had more challenging experiences to help us process that and learn from them. The insights that we develop and the lessons that we learn can then be applied to maintaining good practice for improved service provision for the individual then. So not just us, but also passing that on to the service users. By engaging in self-reflection, um, we can see this professional growth. Um, if we continuously review our practice and see that feedback from the individuals we work with, from colleagues maybe, so that peer review process, other professionals and identify areas for improvement. And it's really about embracing that growth mindset and um, being open, so not taking things personally, being open to learning from our own experience, but from others as well. And seeing that as a positive thing. So as I've said, we've all come from different life experiences, different skills and knowledge sets, um, learning from different universities, um, different professions and specialities. If you've worked within um, elderly care and you're then moving over to neuro, what can you bring with you? What's transferable? What can we share? What's worked well? Um, um, that we can utilise with the client groups that we work with. And now, finally, I just wanted to highlight our important role um, in advocating and promoting awareness. Now, health in inequalities, I mean, if we think about the individuals that we tend to work with, those who need postural care, those who need specialist seating, um, often have complex needs, complex presentations, now, health inequalities are so significant that, as an example, men with learning disabilities die on average 23 years sooner than the men in the general population. Women with learning disabilities die on average 27 years sooner than women within the general population. 
It's even believed that around 50% of individuals with a learning disability die prematurely from respiratory related conditions, which we know can be directly impacted by posture and their positioning. So we can play as posture care professionals, those interested in specialist seating, we can play a significant role here by raising awareness and advocating for those who need us. We need to take every opportunity to raise awareness of the importance of postural care and the role the specialist seat in plays within that 24 hour approach. We can educate professionals, we can share our knowledge and skills, we can also empower clients and caregivers, make sure that they know about the benefits um, because they will have their own networks as well where they, they can disseminate that information. They'll have their own support systems um, where they can share that, that, that important role of postural care. We can advocate for the inclusion of specialist seating in care plans. Um, of course, somebody will have maybe someone um, who has management plans in place. They'll, of course, have a bed in place. They tend to have wheelchairs, but we can really advocate for the inclusion of specialist seating within those care plans. Um, because if somebody is spending eight hours in bed, eight hours in the wheelchair, what are they doing with our other eight hours? OK, we all, even within the general population, we tend to have alternative seating. We might have our work chairs, our desk chairs in work and we go home and we sit on a sofa. It's different objectives um, and that's what special seating offers. It allows individuals to maybe move from rigid wheelchairs, um, it's basically for transit, to being able to sit out comfortably in the evenings in energy management might be the goal here being able to engage with loved ones might be the goal dampening down involuntary movements um, and encouraging engagement with the environment so different objectives and that's where special seating plays the role and we can really highlight that by sharing research that we come across success stories case studies and your own expertise as well you can hopefully change perceptions and encourage that broader adoption of specialist seating as an essential component of comprehensive care. Now, I know that navigating health and social care systems can be challenging, um, not only for us when we think about funding resources, but also for individuals as well with complex needs. Um, and we can advocate for those individuals by playing our role to determine needs and helping them to access funding to secure the support that they need and coordinate that with other health and social care providers. So our advocacy efforts will have a significant impact on their ability to obtain the resources they need. We have done webinars in the past because I, I totally understand and appreciate um, budget restraints. Um, there's always going to be a difficulty with obtaining funding. We have done webinars in the past um, specifically on clinical justifications. Um, this is something that we are doing on our next webinar as well. So if you haven't signed up for that, going into clinical justifications for seating to hopefully highlight um, how the outlay, the initial cost of seating in the short term actually has a, um, a great improvement in the long term and actually is cost effective in in. Um, making sure that we use resources appropriately, getting equipment right the first time um, and utilising resources so that it's accessible for all. So I totally appreciate the restraints. Um, we do have clinical justification documents for each of our chairs as well, the specific for the functions and accessories that are available. So again, if you need um, support with that, if you have, um, if you've recently done an assessment or if you have an assessment that you want to book in um, around specific chairs, then we can supply those clinical justifications to help you hopefully obtain the funding that you need to put that in place. Um, the key thing around clinical justifications is making sure that we are highlighting the need um, clearly demonstrating how specialist seating and the functions and accessories address that need, providing the evidence. Um, so we, we in our clinical justifications, you've got the research there, the, um, the most up-to-date guidelines to help support why that be needed. But we also need to highlight the risk factors as well. What if we don't provide this, this chair? What, what are the risk factors associated with not getting it right the first time? Um, not being proactive, but actually reactive to things. Um, if somebody has good skin integrity currently, um, but we've identified that they are at risk of developing um, pressure injuries, for example, from prolonged sitting, asymmetrical sitting, um, maybe they've had a change 
such as a diagnosis of a stroke and suddenly they sit for prolonged periods of time, they're unable to change or shift their weight independently. We know that prolonged sitting can cause skin breakdown. So special seating is there to help offer a change of position, but also the pressure redistributing surface that they need. So if we don't supply that, what could be the cost out outlay of not providing special seating? We talk about grade four pressure ulcers, for example, costing um, up to £15,000 just to treat that compared to maybe the three, £4,000 that would be needed for, um, for providing the chair in the first place. But again, we hope we can support you with those clinical justifications. So if you've got specific client queries, again, reach out to us, use the chat functions and our, um, our email address and my contact will be on the presentations that we send out as well. So anything we can do to support that and help you to advocate and raise awareness as well. We're really passionate about that. So in summary, then, there's a lot of information, a lot of me talking at you, um, but I think this is really important to help elevate and really consider some of the things that you can do, not only just supply in the chair, but thinking holistically around that um, and improving service provision as well going forward, considering how um, uh, um, and how difficult it can be at the moment to navigate. So we need to stay informed. Um, we need to ensure comprehensive assessments, think about that interdisciplinary collaboration and how that leads into education and training, but also for the individual and the caregivers as well. Um, customizing our approach to the individual so that real personalized care approach. Do we have any gaps in our own knowledge when we think about CPD? Is there anything that we don't feel confident or confident with when it comes to postural assessments and seating assessments? How do you maximize that when you work with seating providers like us? What can you bring to that assessment so that we are targeting all aspects of um, that individual's care? We need to engage in best practice and stay informed but then take our role seriously when we're advocating and raising awareness as well. And ultimately, make this meaningful difference in the lives of the individuals that we work with and this commitment to make it a positive impact. I have mentioned some of the resources um, that we have in place, um, but hopefully, just to highlight, if you didn't know, we had some of this stuff. I mean, our website, we have a lot of information. There's a, a wealth of knowledge on there, all the blogs that um, I've written and colleagues have written, um, and guest blogs as well. Um, over the years are all on there with links, hyperlinks to um, different seating solutions that can help us on the postural challenges in front of you. Um, so, yeah, blogs and articles, case studies, success stories, clinical evaluations as well. So things like our water cell technology, um, if you don't know about our, our seated support systems, um, we utilize this unique water cell technology, which plays into the role of, of pressure care as part of integrating into that seating system. So if that's something that's new to you, um, we've got clinical evaluations around water cell technology um, that was published in the Journal of Tissue Viability. So that was an independent testing. Um, so if you needed that clinical justification, um, We've also got, um, of course, our live monthly webinars that are continuing. We started these up um, during the pandemic um, and they've just grown and grown and grown. And we now we utilize them every every month, different topics. Um, so sign up to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss out on those dates. We've got an encyclopedia of specialist seating. And we've got a smaller compact version, the pocketbook of seating that you can take out and about with you as a quick reference guide, which is more about the practical elements of seating assessment and prescription. Um, but we've also got our training as well. So I said how important education is and we and we take that even though we're um, a seating manufacturer and provider. Um, we're also a key part of, of our um, service provision is around education as well and our educational programs and how our webinars fit into that. But also the ability to offer face to face training, virtual training, uh, full clinical training days. We also have our road shows that go on throughout the year all across the country. Um, and depending on the need within your area, um, bespoke sessions as well. So again, the contact details are there. You'll have access to this training at careflex.co.uk. And there's all the references. So you'll get that shared at the end. Let's stop that share so you can get me back on the screen. And hopefully 
you can see me now. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. It was quite strange me just talking at myself for the last 45 minutes, but hopefully that's been uh, giving you an idea of how some hints and tips really to elevate clinical practice. Um, I don't know, Kim, if there's anything glaringly obvious you needed me to answer anything that's come up. I've shared lots of links in the chat. Brilliant. So hopefully everyone can uh, navigate to those. Uh, again, if you just contact us on our email info at careflex.co.uk, if there's anything specific. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. So if there's if there's been a theme or anything in the chat function, if anyone's um, um, asked for specific information, or if you think of anything after this, once you kind of digest uh, me talking about you for the last 45 minutes, um, if there's anything that you need to ask, then just, yeah, just reach out to us and um, um, we'll guide you as, as best possible. But thank you very much for joining us um, and um, I hope you see you next month for the next webinar.